No, we actually had our first kid after nine years of marriage because my wife and I were so messed up because of life that it took nine years just to get through everything to be stable and normal. So that's why we waited so long. But we can only say thank you to the Lord because we, we really, as we've wrestled through life, decided that if we are going to be true to the gospel, if Christ is who he says he is, if the word of God is true, then we need to see it change our lives. It needs to change us. And so we've had to make difficult decisions over the years to say, God, this is the truth. doesn't matter what happens. We need to see you change us. And he did. And so our greatest treasure on this earth and in life is our family. Uh, we've started a new generation coming out of broken families. We've started a new generation to say it's not so and it's not going to be like that in the future. But I'm here to speak about worldview and what I can tell you, I've got, I don't know what to say in the short space of time because worldview is a complex subject. So I'm going to try and say as much as what I can, get through what I can in the time allotted. And I have brought a friend of mine, uh, Franz Masenya, he's a pastor from Soshanguve. We've been friends now since 2007. And I asked him specifically to come along because we, we want to ask the difficult questions of life and deal with them. And coming out of the struggle that we are facing in our country, I am totally convinced the issue in our country is not racism. Rabbi Zacharias said the following. He said, if we acknowledge that all ideas are not equal we will find equality amongst humanity. If we say all ideas are equal, we are going to find inequality amongst humanity. And that, I think, is what's going on in our country at the moment. We are battling ideas, but we don't recognize the ideas that we are battling. And it's a worldview issue, and we've got a collision of worldviews that's taking place. Instead, what we see is a relativism of ideas in our country that everything's okay in what we think and what we believe. And so what do we then see? We see huge inequality amongst humanity. And we've got to recognize it. It's a worldview issue. And if we are merely looking at each other and saying, well, uh, you were previously disadvantaged, we, were, uh, 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 we weren't, and so on, we are not understanding the issues at stake here. And so I've asked France to come along because when we have some answers and questions later on, I think it's important that if anybody does have a question, that one must hear from, okay, well, I'm a Caucasian. Well, how do I view stuff? But how do I answer a question? You know, he's my African brother. You know, and we've been friends now for many years dealing with the difficult things. And what is his take on it that we can see? But you know what? There's a common ground that we do have in Christ, especially if we're the church of Christ. And we need to recognize where the battle is. So I'm going to speak about worldview. All right. <clears throat> Starting off with worldview. The, the important thing that we need to do uh, with worldview is have a definition that we can all hold on to and recognize and say, all right, this is a worldview. Let's work with it to see where we can go. Now, uh, you've read Timothy Keller's book. Uh, what's his book now again? Uh, yeah, Every Good Endeavor. So when I was asked to come and speak, I got a hold of the copy and I read the book. And reading what Timothy Keller says, this is basically the summary of everything that he says if you read the book through. Part one, God's plan for work is an application of Genesis chapter one and two, the purpose of creation. The purpose of creation and humanity's role in creation. Then he moves on to the, pro the, the second uh, part of the book is our problem with work, which is the application of Genesis three, the effect of sin on humanity and creation. That's what he's dealing with. Then he moves on to, the, in the third part, is the gospel and work, looking at the application of redemption to humanity in this world. 
as we, go, as we look through it, uh, looking at chapter 9, that, that was made reference to earlier, it's about the story that undergirds work. And so I want to just share, uh, read a couple of things uh, to you later on that indicates a story and how a story impacts our lives. Now, in defining worldview, this I have found to be the, the simplest but most comprehensive Definition of a worldview. And it comes from James Sire's book, Worldview as a Com uh, Concept, page 19. He says, a worldview is a set of presuppositions. Those are assumptions which may be true. They may be partially true or entirely false. But it's a set of assumptions or presuppositions which we hold. We all have presuppositions about life and reality as a whole. And we hold to these consciously or unconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, but they are there about the basic makeup of the world. And it's me finding myself here in this world in reality. I go about my daily business. I do what I do. But the question is, how often do I ask the question, why? Why do I do what I do? Why do I think the way that I think? Why do I say what I say? Why do I deal with situations the way I deal with it? Why do I drive like I drive? Why do I react the way I do to conflict? Why do I react the way that I do to pressure? Why do I react the way I do to pleasure? Why do I react the way I do to pain? Why do I react the way I do in family settings, in the office, wherever I go? Why do I do it? And we don't ask this question enough and then to say, okay, but wait a minute. Well, if I'm going to answer the question, is it true or is it consistent with the gospel? And then I have to ask myself, well, if it's, if it's not consistent with the gospel, why isn't it? If it is consistent with the gospel, why is it? And that, if we don't follow this process, we will always find ourselves having a very shallow existence, a very shallow walk with God. We need to be critical about in our thinking as to why we do what we do and the lives we live in this world. Now, uh, Sire has gone on in his book, The Universe Next Door. And I, I encourage anybody to get these books and to read Sire's books. The reason they are introduction to worldview. If you really want to get into worldview, you need to go, you, you need to do study philosophy. You need to study comparative religions because let me tell you, Muslims are now forming uh, 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 systematic theologies. They are promoting philosophy based on their religion and how you ought to live life. You know, so not everybody go, must go that route, but an elementary introduction. I encourage you, get James Sire's work just to get you going. In his book, The Universe Next Door, James Sire lists these eight questions that we ask to help uncover a worldview. If you've listened to a lot of Ravi Zacharias speak, he takes worldview together around four main points. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And when we are dealing with origin, what are we talking about? And so I find that James Sire unpacks this a little for us. So the first question that Sire uh, puts out there is, what is prime reality? What is that which is ultimate reality, the really real? Answer the question. Secondly, what is the nature of external reality? That is the world around us. How does it work? What makes it work? How do we define it? Thirdly, what is a human being? Define a human being as comprehensively as possible. Number four, what happens to a person at death? Now, as we go on, I want to show you just some of the ideas that we are facing in our country today that we need to be aware of because it's affecting our, our whole workforce. And all these things come to play when you're doing business, when you're in the office, when you're working with somebody, when you're watching TV, when you're listening to the news. What people think about this, it's there for us to see. We must stop and ask why. 
Moving on, the next question, number five. Why is it possible to know anything at all? How did humanity get to a place of being able to know anything about everything? Epistemology. How do you know that what you know is right? What's your basis for understanding reality to say, my grasp on reality, it's consistent with reality? Next question, number six. <clears throat> How do we know what is right and wrong? Who or what determines what is right or wrong? You know, now, now, I've had conversations with you know, people for many years now. And this is a wonderful question that comes up. Uh, somebody, uh, one youngster some years ago, I was at a high school, and, you know, teenagers sometimes just, they just got this overinflated sense of ego. So this one young guy is like very arrogant, and I, I asked these youngsters, matric kids, who determines right or wrong? And I mean, this guy being as arrogant as what he is, he says, uh, the government. I said, all right, so let me understand. So are you saying the government is your source of morality? So whatever the government says is right or wrong? Yes. I said, are you absolutely sure about that? He said, yes. So I said to him, then I've got a question for you. Why was apartheid wrong and why did everybody rise up to overthrow apartheid? It's a worldview question. I mean, I've never seen anybody backtrack as fast as that to stop and realize the gravity of the question that we are asking and then to see, but wait a minute, if I'm consistent, if I'm holding to this is my standard of morality, it comes into conflict with all of life and my experience. But can we answer the question? It's a worldview question of utmost importance. Next. What is the meaning of human history? What causes it and how can we best define it? Is it a random time span during which events take place with no significance? Is there purpose? Is there a goal to which history is moving? You know, and again, when we understand the, the battle of, of, of ideas in our country around the, the colliding worldviews, you can actually see the impact of this and the working out of it in our country. And then the last question. What personal life-orienting core commitments are consistent with this worldview? Now, all I can tell you is this. If you're going to embark on a journey of worldview, you need to say, how many years have I still got here on earth because I need to devote myself to this? I cannot stop. James Sire in his book, Discipleship of the Mind, goes on to say the following. The Christian mind is continually in formation and reformation because the truth of the gospel must fashion and form the way I think. But as I continue living through life, I need to engage the world and ask, am I embracing the revelation of God to interpret life and then to live life and conduct my life according to what God is saying? Or are we just saying, well, no, you see, tragically, uh, for us as Christians, that attitude is so rife in our country. If you look at the questions that our culture and society as a whole is being challenged with, I find this year in and year out when students come to the college, it's like they come with an arrogance. It's like, yeah, and I'm a Christian, I've been like this for years. We get into the word of God and they need to study it and then suddenly they realize, I don't know who God is because my experience and understanding of God has been rooted on what I thought, what I've heard, but never on a sound investigation of, his, of the scriptures. Secondly, then when we start dealing with, 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 with the questions of why Christianity is true, they suddenly start coming alive because they're saying, why did nobody tell us this? Why did nobody tell us the truth about the gospel, how strong the gospel is? That the gospel is the very, it, it, it defines everything in life. And I know it's true. And I can demonstrate that it's true. You see, and this is a challenge that we are faced with. Now, you know, uh, this comes from uh, James Sire's book, Universe Next Door, I encourage you, the latest edition, he's gone to be with the Lord now, there won't be an update, at least not from him. 
Uh, I, I encourage you, get it and read it. You, uh, every year when my students read it, they say, oh, the language is so tough. And I say, yeah, I know. You're smarter than what you think. Get with it, you'll be smart. Just keep reading. And then after they've read four chapters, they say, I'm so disillusioned because I realize I'm not a biblical Christian. I'm a deist. I'm a materialist. I'm a nihilist. I'm an existentialist. And I'm finding myself now being a, a, a new ager because all these ideas that I'm seeing come into conflict with biblical Christianity, and I didn't know it. It's a continual challenge, and we need to be up to the task. Now, an another problem that we have in our country is this one. Cultural anthropology. And I've, I've, you know, we love using the term culture. And I, you know, I've been in missions, I've been around, I've been to a number of countries, uh, I've encountered different cultures, different things. And, and it's amazing how often people say, it's my culture. My question is, what do you mean by culture? Define that. Now, you know, as I've tried to make sense of this world in which we've li we live, I've tried to go and look for definitions, and I got this definition from cultural anthropology by Grunlin and Meyers. Culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a human as a member of society. So when people are saying my culture, I'm saying, what do you mean by that? You know, and many times, culture is now, it's just the way we do things in private at home when I'm not in the public forum. But what are those values that drive it? Uh, uh, Money Slav actually says this about culture. He says there are four experiences unique to every culture. A marriage ritual... Birth of children, ritual, a, a, a coming of age, ritual, and a burial, ritual. And the worldview influences all of that. L let me just raise for you what we, as children of the living God, say, and it reveals a worldview. You want a boyfriend? Oh, why do you want a boyfriend? Why do you want a girlfriend? What do you mean? Oh, you got a boyfriend, your girlfriend. Oh, that's wonderful. We want to get married. Oh, really? You got to think twice. You really want to get married? Marriage is so hard. Oh, you're married. How was honeymoon? It was so cool. Yeah, it was wonderful. Oh, you want to have kids? Oh, kids just, oh. No, time's not your own. Oh, you know, kids are so hard. Oh, so glad the baby's here. Wait till their terrible twos come along. Oh, you threw that. Oh, it's wonderful. Wait till you get teenagers. Oh, God. That's what Christians say. What does our worldview reveal? You see, that these things are there. It's such deep, ingrained things in us. In us and, it, and when we say these things, it's reflecting what I really believe. So, for example, if kids take up my time because my time's not my own, <laughs> I've got no concept of biblical Christianity. Doesn't Psalm 127 say, children are a gift of the Lord. Bless is the man that's got a quiver full of them. I mean, marriage, what a gift. Read Genesis 2. It's amazing. Thank God for marriage. We should be celebrating it. Somebody wants to get married. I'm so, fantastic. See, but, yeah, I'm just finding in our day and age, youngsters want the pleasures of marriage without the responsibilities of marriage because they have seen the brokenness of marriage that they're experiencing in Christian homes. Worldview. It affects everything. You see, so when we are dealing with culture... We've got to understand that how we answer the questions of a worldview undergird the actions that we perform every day. I mean, when you go and read cultural anthropology, there's some cultures. My goodness. 
they believe in their worldview that spirits bring children at specific times of the year and they just disseminate them in the community. It's got nothing to do with uh, sexual intercourse. And so because the children come like that into the womb, the moment a lady is pregnant, they are so scared that evil spirits are going to curse them, they put that lady in seclusion from the moment they discover she's pregnant until the child is three months old. Worldview. You see, when we talk about culture, we've we got to stop a moment and say, okay, wait a minute. Our knowledge, what is our body of knowledge? Where do we get it from? What do we believe about life, reality, God, humanity, about art, morals, our customary practices in our laws? What undergirds our legal system? And there is no civilization that doesn't have this. All civilizations have it. You know, there's been an injustice in the past, you know, and, and uh, it's caused a lot of pain to a lot of people in the uh, especially Africa. And as I'm starting to read and try and understand African traditional religion and African philosophy and, and see, well, we've got to understand this continent. We've got to understand what is it? What is the worldview that is fueling everything on our continent? We want to understand what's going on. And here is a task for me as a white person. I need to understand what African worldview and traditional religion and so on has embodied as ideas that undergird the community, just like my African brothers and sisters need to understand what is it that undergirds me as a white person. And then we've got to say, but wait a minute, we've got to flesh through this to say what is biblically Christian and then we're going to have to make sacrifices to say this idea, this belief, this action must fall by the wayside. My speech must change. My action must change to be consistent with the gospel. And it takes all of us to make the commitment. At least if I understand this, I can begin to engage and I can start looking at my own worldview and speak to my brother and say, but what's... Why do you do this? Why do you think that way? He's saying, if we want to do business, we want to be involved. I mean, I just asked the question. Why does it seem to me that only white folk want to create business that serves mostly white folk and occasionally the odd African person. And why is it, it seems to me, that African business people only want to serve Africans and occasionally the white person where the situation demands? Why? I see this. I see this and it breaks my heart. Why? I see, if we're the body of Christ, we've got to say, wait a minute, we've got to go beyond this. We have to grow beyond this. <clears throat> Oh, let me just see how I'm doing on time. Oh, my time. All right. <clears throat> now, you know, this is, uh, I mean, I struggled with this more than 20 years ago because I felt irrelevant as a Christian, and I said, God, help me. And God graciously led me and helped me think through the Bible, and I actually found that, guess what? This is, I've discovered nothing new here. This is exactly what Tim Keller says. John Stott has been saying the same. You can go back, I don't know how far, 200 years, 300 years. This is what great theologians of the church are saying. The, the framework of a biblical Christian mind, in the beginning, God, what is he like though? He created, created creation. What's the difference between a cre the creator? What must he be like in his essence, in his being, in his character, in his attributes? We need to know that. And then creation, what does it mean to be human? Uh, what's wrong with the world? The fall of mankind, the rebellion against God. That is, that is just made the mandate that God gave humanity uh, difficult to carry out. Because now we lust for power, we lust for, for affluence, we lust for everything. For me, we don't see living in this world as a place to take dominion for His glory, for the good of everybody else, is to see what I can get for me. But that comes from the fall. 
Christ came to undo it. You know, God made it, we messed it up, he fixed it up. But the way he did it is that Christ was born in a community. And he lived in a community. And he presented the truth of who the Father is in community. He brought forth the community, and we need to be a part of this community. You know, when we are saying, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, and I love Jesus, not the church. How would you feel if somebody said, well, I like you, but not your fiancé? <sighs> it's like, you, you don't like my wife. It's like, you know, seriously, then you can't be my friend. I'm sorry to tell you that. When we speak of the church, like, you know, I don't like the church. <gasps> really? <laughs> Look at what Scripture says. The fear of God should strike our soul because it's His bride being prepared by His Father for Him. Let's not mess with Him. But we need to embrace that and recognize there's a destiny, there's a future. History is moving somewhere. Now, let me just indicate for you here some of the issues of worldview. Can I take a couple of minutes? just want to bring this to your attention. Listen to this. <clears throat> Outside, the night was alive with the sounds of animals of all kinds, from the faraway roar of lions to the lonely hooting of an owl in the tree at the mouth of the cave. Loudest was the croaking of frogs in the marshes on the edge of the lake. In the heavens above, the stars shone like so many lost jewels against the dark expanse of the moonless sky. The fire river, today called the Milky Way, was one broad and band of smoky brilliance that stretched from one end of the heavens to the other and a dethroned star streaked across it as it fell in disgrace. I was now looking at creation with new eyes and everything I looked at seemed to have assumed a new beauty, a new freshness. I'd been listening to a very strange story, the story of creation, the story of how life came to this earth and the one who is telling me this story was none other than the creator herself. She told me all about the first people, about Amarava and about Odu. I was feeling very small, a mere speck of living dust in a universe so utterly incredible. Great mother, I said at long last. But what does one so great as you are want with a wretch like myself? I'm hardly worthy of the love of a crawling louse. Lumakanda, eternity is a vast and incredibly lonely darkness, and even a goddess has to have someone in whom to confide at times to escape from the futility which human beings have misnamed life. I grow tired of roaming the outer darkness alone, deceived and rejected by my erstwhile spouse, the tree of life, a lost leaf in the tempest of eternity. I wish to make a comeback to earth, communicate with the human beings I have created, and I wish to do so through you. Goddess, I am not worthy. Who is? Who in this mad evil world is worthy of attention from me? None, but I had to choose someone, and that someone happens to you. be you. A blood-stained matricide? A slayer of his own parent? Yes. A blood-stained parent slayer because your deed has opened your eyes to the falsehood called life, which is nothing but a lie and a failure from birth to death. You've experienced life as but a horrid nightmare in which only pain, suffering, and death are real. Goddess, how can you who have brought life on earth speak thus? Listen, I did not create the universe and the earth and life upon it out of my own free will. I obeyed the order of a great master who for all that even I know in turn has to obey the orders of an even greater master. The heavens conceal more secrets than even I can understand, even as I was told to do as instructed and ask no questions. Then what is the purpose of life on earth, O great goddess? Do I understand there is really none at all? The only purpose of life is death. Anybody know who wrote that? Anybody heard of Kreda Mutwa? Kreda Mutwa was a witch doctor that was raised on a missionary station at the age of 20 back in the 1960s. He was asked, said by his family, you've played long enough with the whites, you need to come and fulfill your destiny as a witch doctor. He then went on to write a book, Indaba, My Children, in which he divulges the secrets of African traditional religion on the questions of origin. Where do we believe everything comes from? And it is also secretive. He's been threatened with death because he dared write this. But when you listen to this, what do we learn about African traditional worldview? 
You see, we can see already just the conflict with biblical Christianity. And if we look at materialism that has influenced the worldview of us as, uh, as Westerners, we got to recognize that we are all holding ideas, even though they aren't even verbalized at times, that are contrary to biblical Christianity, and they affect the way we view life. If you read John and Beatty on worldview, on African traditional religion, as he has done his research, and before he went to be with the Lord, I think in 2008, he said, no one has yet shown that the way I've researched and come to understand the African traditional view of time is not true. Based on the African traditional view of time, time does not extend into the future. That concept of time, and you read Credo Mutwa, time is eternal, but there's no future time. Time must be created. It's not actual. When you look at the Western world, time is running out. When you look at biblical Christianity, we say God sustains all things for the glory of his name and will accomplish his purpose. The materialistic world says time is money. Because I've taken that which, is, which God has created to be, and I now want to turn it into economic benefit. Because the question is, if time is money, how much time is my wife wasting me because she wants my attention? How much money is my, are my children wasting because they want my time? That's not biblical Christianity. But you see, in African traditional view of time, I don't know that there's going to necessarily be another two to five years. And so I live only for the moment to get as much wealth and everything now, but I don't plan and look long term. You see, these things are deep. They are, they are so dear to us, we don't understand it. But this is the challenge of worldview. There isn't enough to go around. Let me just, my time is up. Closing story. Look, there's much to be said on this. If you've come across Darrow Miller, get hold of his book, Discipling Nations, he says this, regarding the created order and a wisdom-based society. How many years of crude oil left before it runs out? I just heard again the other day, 50 years. I heard that back in the 1970s when I was a kid in primary school. What nonsense! This is God's world. He replenishes it. He is looking after it. Resources are limited. <laughs> Julian Simon made the easiest $1,000 of his life when he decided to put his worldview to test with a bet against Malthusian Ehrlich. Simon challenged Ehrlich to choose any five basic metals. The bet was to see whether between 1980 and 1990 the prices of the metals would rise or fall. If Ehrlich's perspective was right and we lived in a closed system where God does not interact with his creation, where God stands outside of his created order in the deist worldview, there would be more people to consume these raw resources and the metals would increase in price. If Simon was right and the world was an open system in which God intervenes and sustains and nourishes his creation, the prices of the metals would fall. In October 1990, the prices were checked. All five had fallen and Simon and the worldview he advocates was vindicated. It's documented, it is in his book, Discipling Nations by Darrow Miller. Our worldview, what we believe about God, what we believe about creation, the way we understand society... All these questions, we need to come and say, God, what do I believe, but what is the Scriptures affirming? It's going to take effort. It's going to take time. But if you would dedicate yourself to say, Lord, I want to understand, it will change your entire life. My last point of application. When you listen to what Credo Mutwa says, the goddess is a mother, and so you've got a matrilineal worldview. You've got a matrilineal worldview clashing with a patrilineal worldview. And so we've got a power struggle. If we say we believe the God of the Bible, I have heard, unfortunately, Christians say this. We don't want to appoint a lady for a task because she hasn't had children. She's going to cost us money if we give her this job of responsibility because we're going to have to put her on, what's his name, leave, employ somebody else. Is that a biblical Christian worldview in the marketplace? 
So there are the challenges. They are huge. I'm encouraged because I believe we can do it if we also I'm going to take the challenge to establish a biblical Christian worldview. I think with that, my time is more than up. I do apologize.